Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today's case is set in a location which is steeped in local legend and it's also dear to my heart. I spent many days as a child out at this beach and it is it has a certain kind of mystic energy about it. The west coast of New Zealand is known for its wild waters and tides, rip tides and surf. And Piha Beach has this feeling about it. It's nestled underneath very steep hill ranges called the Waitakere Ranges. And not far from Piha Beach is Mercer Bay. And they are said to be the highest, steepest cliffs in New Zealand. In Māori legend, Hanarangi, she was the chief's daughter. She disappeared from this very spot in Mercer Bay. And the story goes is that she would sit and wait for her beloved to come back from the fishing party. And they would fish on the rocks underneath these very steep cliffs. Now one day while she was waiting for him to return, a freak wave came and engulfed the party of fishermen and swept them out to sea. She was so heartbroken that she would sit there forever pining for her beloved to return. Then one day she decided that she would walk out too into the waters never to return. It is said her spirit went westward down the golden pathway of Tane to join her lover but the likeness of her beauty was forever etched into the cliff. And some people even say that if you are down around that area and you look at the cliff at a certain time from a certain angle, you can actually see the unmistakable likeness of a woman etched into the cliffs of Mercer Bay. Today, a very beautiful carving or pofenua of Hinarangi guards the loop track walk in Mercer Bay. And not long after this carving was erected or unveiled, a woman went missing. And then in 2017, another woman went missing. And then perhaps or somewhat linked, so some people believe, in 2004, another woman went missing. So three women in a decade had just vanished into thin air in the Piha and Mercer Bay area. Piha is an extremely popular destination. The car park at the Mercer Bay Loop Walk is said to get all kinds of characters from the likes of people who want to go hiking and enjoy the, the, the beautiful nature and scenery. But then you also get a dark element as well. Cherie Wuston was a 42-year-old mother from the North Shore. She would often come and visit the Mercer Bay Loop. It was her thinking spot, her sister said. And she loved to go and pick flowers, sit there and think in her car or go for a walk. On the 22nd of December 2012, she had visited the very spot and she was seen around 7.15pm by a couple walking southward down the track, holding a bottle of wine and just wearing jandals. So I guess that says to us that she wasn't really going to be walking far. She was definitely not running in jandals. Her car was found in the car park, unlocked. In Cherie's case, the police were onto the search pretty quickly. They began by searching the actual wooded area of the Mercer Bay Loop Walk, as well as the cliff areas. They soon began to solely focus on the water. To quote from the article, they said they believed she had fallen from the cliffs. Inflatable rescue boats from the local surf clubs were used to search the coast from North Piha to Caddy Caddy. The Westpac rescue helicopter joined them. Wilson's family were naturally distraught as the official search found nothing and wound down after only a few days. They and friends continued looking 
We spent many weeks up there searching. Cherie's brother, Darren Roberts, said they simply found nothing. No bottle of wine, no jandals, no clothing, nothing. For Cherie's family, the emotions suddenly came flooding back in 2017 when another woman went missing in the Mercer Bay Loop area. Police have brought drones in to help their search for missing Auckland runner Kim Bambus. The 21-year-old drove up to Piha Beach on Friday morning telling friends she was going for a run, which she hasn't been seen since. 21-year-old Kim Bambus was a nurse at Middlemore Hospital in Auckland. She originally had lived in the Bay of Islands, not far from where I live here in Whangarei. Her sister described her as tiny and the life of the party. And like Cherie, Kim was very familiar with the Mercer Bay Loop Walk. She would run or walk there quite regularly. On the morning of the 24th of March 2017, Kim had got herself ready for a run. She would put on her active wear, grabbed a bottle of water and set out, but first of all, she went to a supermarket in Grey Lynn. CCTV actually caught her picking up snacks, so it looked like she was getting ready for something maybe later on that day. When Kim didn't arrive back home by the evening, her flatmates got obviously quite worried. With night upon them, the flatmates actually did their own search. They got in their cars and drove quite the distance from Ponsonby all the way out to the beach to look for Kim. When the flatmates were unsuccessful at finding Kim, they reported her missing at 8pm that night. Her car was eventually found in the Log Race Road car park in the exact spot where Cherie Muston's car had been found a few years earlier. The police noticed that Kim's cell phone was still in her car. So the search began and proceeded all through the night with helicopters involved as well. Kim's sister came all the way down from the Bay of Islands as soon as she heard that she'd gone missing. Over the weekend, there were more than 20 people on the ground searching for Kim, combing through the bush around the Mercer Bay Loop track and surrounding area, as well as a helicopter and dog units. But they found nothing, and the search is now aerial only. Continuing down the track for around 20 to 25 minutes from the start, Police search and rescue teams are using drones to search the cliff face, looking at any nooks and any landings because at some parts of this track, there is no barrier stopping you from accidentally going over the several hundred metre high cliff. Police were not giving interviews today, but said they decided to focus the search on the cliffs based on information gathered into Kim's activities in the days prior to her disappearance. Shoreline searches were organised with the locals at Kari Kari and Piha. Police did letter drops in both communities. The search for Bambus was intense. Infrared cameras were even used to tease out small differences in heat sources that can show up a dead body hidden in the dense bush. And so this search continued for days, but nothing showed up. So two women, attractive brunettes, just vanished into thin air. And comparisons were quickly made with another notorious disappearance from 2004. On a very cold and stormy night, a young woman was sighted naked, walking down one of the main roads leading to Piha Beach. They were obviously startled, but realised the woman wasn't in any trauma of any kind. So they watched from a distance until she disappeared. They didn't think to report it to police until they heard helicopters the next morning. And suddenly the name Irena Asher was known to most New Zealanders. Irena's case was controversial due to a mishandled emergency call. Irena had called 111, but unfortunately a police car was never sent. A taxi was instead, but the taxi didn't even get to Piha. It was sent to another suburb in Auckland. The night of Irena's disappearance, she had been partying with friends 
at a very new boyfriend of hers and she had said to be drinking but wasn't a drug taker. The people at the party said her behaviour was somewhat odd. She was said to be dancing one minute, upset the other. And then suddenly she just disappeared, she went on the run. A local woman and her son then found Irena and welcomed her into their home. They looked after her but didn't want to call the police as she seemed to be quite weary as she'd already rung them earlier that night and must have got the run around. So they didn't want to scare her. So they tried to comfort her, they put her to bed, she had a shower, but she then went on the run again. Her next sighting was by the couple who saw her somewhat naked uh, under a street light acting quite oddly. Irena was known to have bipolar disorder, but some people believe that she had been drugged. It's unsure of why she was acting the way she was and whether it was due to drugs or her, her mental state at that point in time. But later, a coroner said that he believed that she died from an accidental drowning. Since the disappearance of her sister, Rachel Rustin has often visited the Musa Bay Loop Track Walk. She says the bush is really dense. It's really difficult for you to wander, just simply wander off the path get lost and somehow fall from the cliffs. She's been quoted to say, if they are falling into the ocean, why is nothing floating up? Why is nothing showing up? And that is actually a really good question. Similar to the Irena Asher case, the coroner considered it likely that Cherie Rustin also drowned. Now some people again consider this a bit of a cop-off really, also considering that Kim Bambus has recently gone missing there too. And in actual fact, we know what happens if someone does fall off the cliff. In 2016, Fiona Hamilton, an Australian tourist, was with her husband when she asked him to take her photo. She accidentally stepped back too far and fell off the cliff. Now her body was found quite easily. She didn't fall all the way into the water. Her body actually fell onto the cliff. The article says the cliffs may seem vertical when you're standing on top of them, but they mostly arc out seaward, usually many metres, and they are studded with ledges and sharp outcrops of rock. When the Auckland Line rescue team made the difficult recovery of Hamilton's body, the abseilers had to frequently stop to place protection on their ropes where they rubbed against the sharp rocks. The article basically goes on to say that if someone fell, there would be remnants or evidence of where they fell. Some people argue that even if Vustin and Bambus had fallen clear off the cliff into the water, their bodies would still eventually be washed up perhaps at Murawai or Bethel's Beach, further down the coast. The Herald article says it's rare that we don't find the body. Perhaps they're not intact, but they do wash up. Victims of drownings at Piha and the notorious Tihanga fishing rocks are usually found a few days later up the coast in Murawai. So if they didn't fall into the water and they didn't drown, if their bodies are somewhere in the bush, will they ever be found? Well, it's not unlikely and not unheard of that bodies are eventually found years later in some strange hiding spot. And if a person intentionally goes into the forest to harm themselves, is it possible for them to hide their bodies? Well, yes, I guess you could argue that if they didn't ever want to be found, they could possibly put themselves in a position where it's very hard to find them unless you were told. An example of the forest eventually giving up the dead was an archaeologist walking down the Ahu Ahu track, which is part of the Mercer Bay Loop Walk. He used to walk past regularly this rock, and one day he was compelled to pick it up. 
And when he did, he realized it was a human skull. It turned out to be an amateur botanist who had gone missing seven years earlier. Now you only have to log on to reddit.com to get the feeling that people are divided. Some people believe that it's impossible for someone to have fallen into the water and not eventually wash up, whereas others think it's quite probable. In the case of Pihar Beach, the currents in the surf there is really strong. I've actually had to be pulled out of there by surf lifesavers more than once. So with that in mind, some people believe that it would be quite probable for a body to be swept out to sea and never found again. Now I'm regularly scouring the internet for updates on these cases and so far all I've found is a report from around the 4th or the 5th of October 2017 when a body was found on Piha Beach but the body at that point was unidentified. They did say that updates would be made but I can't find anything and to be honest I don't think this is linked to these missing women's cases because it seems too long since both of them have gone missing. But that said, it's not uncommon for families if they discover a loved one has harmed themselves that they just wish to have privacy and therefore no more public statements are made. So perhaps this is the case, but it just seems to be a dead end on that story. So I did think that was quite curious. Piha had quite a prevalent drug industry happening when Irena Asher went missing in 2004. Some people believe that her disappearance is due to her perhaps witnessing something or maybe she was even just injured by someone who just did not want to be caught by the police at the time. If that were the case, no doubt her body would have been transported away from the Piha area and it was noted at the time that the police did not close down the Lone Cody or Waiatatura roads, so they could have got away quite easily. A lot of local residents still believe that a darker scenario has taken place in these cases. Cherie Wuston's brother told the Herald there's always the thought of other scenarios. He says that he believes that both Kim and Cherie went out and succeeded in what they wanted to do that day, which was either go for a walk, relax, maybe find some peace, and they did get back to their cars. He thinks that something happened once they got back to the car park. He says his sister's unlocked car could be read as carelessness or as an indication that she returned to her vehicle. He says, to me, it was the car park, not the cliffs, where their lives came into jeopardy. The families of Irena, Cherie and Kim have both explained that they all had a lot to live for. But their families truly believe that they didn't take their own lives. So what actually did happen? I really hope some more evidence comes to light on these three cases for the sake of the families but also if anything I hope that it helps us make the west coast beaches of Auckland that much safer for us to enjoy and to avoid these tragic things happening again in the future.